Hi, I'm Jed Vance with Bonding with Board Games. Today I'm going to review Holdfast Korea, published by Worthington Publishing, designed by Mike and Grant Wiley in 2015. This is a low complexity block game on the Korean War from 1950 to 1951. Let's go inside and take a look at it. Okay, I set this up for about turn six in the game, which is about September 1st, getting ready to do the Inchon landing here. On a typical turn, you roll for your weather if the chart's calling for it, which right now it's automatically clear, which that could affect your air power and your movement. Then you're going to spend your, you get resource points in this. Um, depending on, okay, at the begin, North Korea is always going to get 10. When the Chinese intervene, they jump to 15. The UN starts with 6 per turn, and then it goes up 2 all the way till they get to 16. So eventually they will have more. It just takes a while to build up. It represents that build up they had. But first you're going to take your supply points and decide what you want to spend on replacements. Um, if you have any eliminated units, you can bring them in. There's rules about setting them up how many, and how many points it costs. If you want to add strength to blocks, you can do so. So you're going to spend those points, like I want to spend one to move to increase this guy to strength three, one to move that guy to strength three, let's say. Okay, then you decide to move and combat. The cool thing about this game is the blocks can do both and they don't have to do them at the same time. They don't have to do them in any order. You can combat, come back later, move, do some movement, gather a whole bunch of guys around and fight. You can also attack hexes multiple times. The way it works, it costs one point to move a block. It costs one point to attack a block, not one point per unit, so that these three gang up here, it's just one point. Let's say they attack thinking they can blow them open, but they don't get lucky with the dice and he's a strength one. This guy can then turn and attack. It costs you another point. Then you roll them up. So you gotta, you're sitting there thinking through your fences. Where do I want to spend my points at? And how many do I have left over so then I can spend them on replacements? You don't want to spend haphazardly on your replacements or you won't think through your fences and not have enough. So you're trying to blow open a hole and get that big breakthrough. The victory conditions in this game, the reason you're doing all this battle is historically the communists are trying to take these four points and let's see. Oh, Tegu. Okay, these four. Put Pusan, Tegu. I'm not even going to try to say this other one in Seoul. The, UN has to capture these four points up here. If you can do that, it's automatic victory. It's tough. I've never done it. I've come very close multiple times, but never been able to pull it off, just as both sides came fairly close in the war. Um, anyways, so now it's the, they do all this stuff. And when you fight, like I said, you're going to get so many dice per unit. It's not your strength like it is in Columbia. This unit gets just, this two strength unit gets three dice. This guy gets three dice. All communist blocks get three dice. South Koreans get, one, get um, two dice. They're not nearly as powerful. The American units get four, except for the Marine unit that's coming in gets five. A little more firepower there. Most, I have, most of the units I have eliminated because by this point, you're really building up those U.S. forces around to hold that perimeter. Now, once it's the U.S.'s turn, you're going to check your reinforcements. You bring them in to the, to the Japanese Far East command box. Bring them in. Most of them come in at strength one, but this rep these guys come in at full strength. This is Army Division and this is Marine Division. This represents how MacArthur had been holding them back and building up for Inchon. What's so cool about this game is you don't have to attack Inchon because of some fiddly rule. You do it because it'd be dumb not to do it. You trace supply through the rail network you see on this map. Now, if you can see all these rails, you're not going to be tracing supply through these mountains down here. So you've got a big gap there. You can't trace supply. If you end your turn out of supply, every block out of supply loses a step. It also affects your movement ability. So all these rails come through Seoul. There's no anchor on Seoul. You want to come in a harbor, you're coming in through Inchon. Now, along with movement and fire that cost a point each, you can do one amphibious, I mean one naval transfer per turn cost a point to go from here to here, from Japan to Pusan. Go anywhere else, it's two points. It has to be a friendly anchor. Only once per turn. Also, um, to, if you want to go to an enemy anchor, start at your own anchor, go to an enemy. That's an amphibious invasion. That costs three. Okay, so when you come in attack, and something I forgot to mention earlier is you can dedicate these resources to the battle. Should have mentioned this. When you roll dice, like these three are attacking him, each are rolling, you're going to add up your dice, subtract anything for train modifiers, combat simultaneous, roll your dice, he hit on fives and sixes. The other guy's going to roll up his dice. Like I said, it's not strength dependent, it's unit dependent. He has one strength, but he will roll four dice. Okay, you can also allocate in resources. The UN has air, has air superiority. You just 
Throw in one of these blocks. It's an extra two dice automatically. It's attack or defense. Naval has to be down here on a shoreline. Attack or defense. Armor is only used on attack. Cannot be used in the mountains. As you can see, most of this brown. This is all mountains. It's not too useful in this game. Okay. North Korea starts with these. Anytime you roll a six, not only does it hit their infantry, it also eliminates this for good because Russians weren't supporting them too, or Soviets, I should say. But these are always are used. Attack or, I mean, these are attack or defense. But since I'm going for Inchon, I'm going to save some of this stuff. So when it comes time, have this guy spend my three points and attack. Then you throw everything you can, which is one air, one naval. He rolls five, six, seven, eight, nine dice. He is rolling three. And there's rules about how you do more than one round of combat on, on amphibious invasions. You blow it open, you hold it, then the next guy spends two points, because now that's a friendly anchor. Boom, gets to move into here, and then you spend another point, he can attack Seoul. Put him out of supply, which is probably what will happen historically. Okay, now, then, you, then when these guys hurt and these guys start pushing back, and then you can start to do these anchors, anchor to anchors if you have it set up right, and start trying to hit back here if you want. But you start pushing. Now, once you go across the 38th parallel, you're going to come over here at the start of every turn and roll a dice. First turn on a six, the Chinese will intervene. Second turn, five to six. Third turn, four through six. It's more and more likely to finally the sixth turn. If they haven't intervened, they will. All of these Chinese units come in up here, and they are tough to beat. I don't know if you can see it or not. They are strength eight. The way they pull that off in this game, let's see if I can get that. Strength eight is they make a second block for every one of these units. So it's four, three, sorry, oops, sorry, four, three, two, one. Just like the Marine is a strength six, so he has a two and a one. They're going to come up here. They still only get three dice, but they're hard to kill because it just represents the amount of bodies they had. They just kept throwing bodies at these guys. Something else I didn't mention was you can, you can bring back eliminated units, but if the Marine unit gets eliminated, he's gone for good. It costs one point to add a strength point, but it costs three to bring back the Marines. Remember, they're harder to hit that you only hit them on six instead of five and six. Tougher to hit. They're like the tanks in the Russian game, Hold Fast Russia. Um, and they're very expensive to build back, and you're going to make sure they stay well supplied and well armed because they're that important to your cause. So you'll push down here, see if you can beat it. You'll probably get close, but not succeed. Push back here really hard. You'll make a mad dash for the Yalu. Once the Chinese intervene, they'll come back and you're going to try to settle. And once you get to the third, at the end of the game, whoever has the most strength points on the other side of the 38th parallel wins the game. So it's going to play out historically just like the war did. Okay, we're back. On the New York, on the New York um, review, I talked about the Kickstarter extras. And this one, this didn't have any Kickstarter extras. They wanted this thing out fast and they really delivered it within a month of the end of the Kickstarter. What they did was they put out this book, a company book, after the fact. It is taken from some U.S. Army actual documents. They gathered them up and published in a book. They're not allowed to sell it or probably use it to induce sales. So after the fact, they wrote us and said, hey, thanks for backing us. We're going to give this to you as a thank you gift. So I don't know if that's in there or if that would violate those terms. So you probably have to check on it. If so, it's a really interesting book. I mean, it's official documents that cover what the game is about. As for the game itself, I really enjoyed this thing. It's one, going to be one of my favorites of this year. Um, right now, it's probably my favorite. I know Hands in the Sea is still coming out, and there's a band of brothers, so we'll see if it makes it to the end. You'll have to watch Ham Tag for that. Um, but as far as the game itself, I had a blast with this thing. Now, I have the Victory Games version. Love the game a lot. It's a little big. That's an understatement. Takes a long time. Not particularly playable. Um, you know, you want, got a one sitting game to play with somebody. So that's the strength of this one. It's a different audience. Simple game. You can go on their website, see their five minute tutorial on how to play the game. Um, if you played Hold Fast Rush, you already know most of this game already because of the system. But, um, you know, it's about a three hour game. So it's one setting, very light covers, but it covers the broader parts of the war. I mean, you get the big push to the Pusan, I'm sorry. You get the big push to the Pusan Peninsula, then right up to the Yalu River, the Chinese come in, they fall back, and then you end up with this big battle near the 38th parallel where it kind of stalls out. Um, some, I've seen two complaints on it. I don't think either one have any validity. One of them is that they say, well, it's just kind of a dull stalemate at the 38th parallel. So let me say it again because I kind of hopped a little bit. <laughs> okay. Something they'll say a second. There's a couple of um, complaints you might read about on this. I don't think either one really have any merit when you think about it. One of it is that they'll say, well, it's 
kind of a stalemate every game where it comes around the 38th parallel. And I'm thinking, if you don't like that, why did you buy a game on the Korean War? Um, so the other one is that there seems to be, some people have tried to uncover this Halifax hammer type of strategy where the North Koreans go like two hexes in and then stop. Really? Do you really think the North Korean president is going to get Russia involved to give them T-34 T T tanks and back up and support so they can go 50 miles into South Korea and stop at Seoul? I mean, why are you playing these games? It's not like you, it's a Eurogamy where these guys are into trying to break things. Eurogamy is what I call Euro games and I'm mocking them, which is frequently. Um, no, if you're buying this game, I assume you're trying to, you know, simulate the Korean War. They could have added a bunch more rules. You, know, you could house rule and say if you don't take two of the four objectives by turn six, you automatically lose. And if the uh, UN doesn't take two of the four objectives by turn 10 or something like that. But they're not trying to bog it down in rules. I think they're figuring you're going to try to play this thing semi-historically, which is pretty easy. It's not difficult. Push, push, push. Get all the way down, take the four objectives. And then when you're the UN, keep pushing hard before the Chinese intervene. If you play it that way, there's none of this game-breaking strategy. It plays out quite historic. And it's really fun to see how you can do compared to your historical counterparts. Every time I play this game, I make that rat mad da dash down to Pusan. And I don't really get it. I try and I try and I try and someday I'm going to get it and it's going to be the most awesome thing ever. The point is, it's really hard. It was hard back then. By the time the UN got their perimeter set up, it was going to be hard to break. Um, likewise, I don't know if you can push fast enough to get to the Yalu, but I've come close. I've taken three of the four objectives, including Pusan. I couldn't take one of the fourth ones because my opponent wasn't building up the UN forces. He kept trying to build up the South Koreans and I blew a wide open hole. Likewise, I had another opponent who went a little bit into, whoops, sorry. You're good, keep going. Okay. Likewise, I had an opponent who tried to, on the other side, who didn't push nearly as aggressive enough, and I hit him way behind with the amphibious attack, cut off the supplies, and if the Chinese hadn't intervened early, and he got the lucky die roll, I would have had it. I was very, very close to the Yalu River, just right off Chosen, interestingly enough. Um, so, yeah, it does do this back and forth, and that's why I get a kick out of this game, where the Russian one is just push, 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 and then stall. This is back and forth, so each get a chance to punch each other in the mouth. So if you're really interested in Korea, this captures those big, those big parts of it. Also interesting how you manage, how they work in the thing, the parts like the Marines being so powerful, and why you really got to protect them and, you know, make sure they, they're at full strength. The air power, the naval. Uh, the way the Chinese have the eight steps into it and, you know, the, the less firepower. They captured a lot of the big meta themes in this and they pulled it off in a really slick format. So when you don't have time to play the victory game or that's just too much game for you, this is the best thing I've seen come along in the Korean War and I've already played it more than the other one. Um, it plays solitaire um, as well as a block game will, which there's not too many surprises. At a certain point, you kind of know who that block is. Um, also, if you see the guy reach over and flip it over, you figure, oh, okay, he's back to strength three. I just saw that one. Um, as there, I did make the Vassal module for this, if Vassal's important to you. It does not play very well by email because of the naval and air. You never know when the other guy's going to use them, but it plays great live. Um, and like I said, in one setting, face-to-face, -face, it plays really quickly. So this game has been a big hit with me. I really like it. Big, way to go, Grant Mike. That's Hold Fast Korea.